Please welcome Cleveland Clinic CEO and President, Dr. Tom Mihaljevic. Welcome to Ideas for Tomorrow. I'm looking forward to speaking with our guest today. It's a very special guest. Alex Gorski is executive chairman of Johnson & Johnson, the world's largest and most valuable healthcare company. More than a billion people use j, &J products every day. Alex's life is a true testament to vision dedication and hard work, and we learn a little bit more about it as we uh, speak with him. From his time at West Point and his service as an Army Ranger to his three-decade long career at Johnson & Johnson, he has constantly strived for improvement. Under Alex's leadership, Johnson & Johnson is making positive impacts on global health and is setting examples in diversity and sustainability. Please join me in welcoming Alex Gorski. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, uh, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Welcome to Cleveland. Well, it's wonderful to be back. Be back. It's been a while, hasn't it? It, it has been. It has been. But uh, a very special place. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. We're absolutely delighted, delighted to have you here. You know, this conversation is interesting for me personally for so, so many so many reasons, but uh, there, is, uh, uh, there, there is something that, uh, that I wonder if you could share, and that is your perspective on a kid from Kansas City uh, ever thinking about 30, 40 years ago that you would do what you're currently doing and that you would accomplish everything that you could have accomplished. What's your, share with us a little bit about your your family background, we saw a bit about, about your, your, your career trajectory, but uh, uh, how, how, do you, how do you look at it, kind of going back, backward and kind of reflecting a little bit about your own accomplishments? Well, Tom, it's a, uh, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, gosh, I guess the, the short version is if you would have asked me 40 years ago, um, you know, as I was... Uh, just getting out uh, of the army and wondering what I was going to do with the rest of my life, that uh, I would have an opportunity to be leading one of the world's largest healthcare organizations at a time of the most significant pandemic we've ever faced in history, let alone uh, be in the middle of a hunt and a race for a vaccine. Um, I could never have imagined that. Uh, and. And beyond that, it actually has simpler roots. I'm sure there's many stories like this right here in Cleveland. Uh, and, and something that you and I share, of course, is that, uh, you know, like you, my, my grandparents were from Croatia and, uh, and came over at the turn of the century. Um, they immigrated to Kansas City. Uh, they, for the most part, worked in meatpacking plants uh, and never could have dreamed uh, that you know, one of their grandchildren would have such an opportunity, uh, but I think it, uh, you know, look, it says a lot about uh, I think our country, uh, and it uh, and it also says a lot about the the great development opportunities I've had, whether it was serving my country uh, or working at a you know an organization like Johnson and Johnson. Yeah. Well, speaking about the service to the country, obviously the. Uh Education at West Point is so impactful. It is legendary. It is legendary because so many leaders in our country came out of West Point. What was the influence of your military education and then later on your military career on your subsequent executive career? You know, it was clearly a seminal experience in my life. And I think I would say I would not be where I am today had it not been for that. I, I was first exposed to Kevin. My father uh, was actually a Korean War veteran, and I can remember very clearly going to a friend's house, and I must have been in about fourth or fifth grade, and one of their sons had gone to West Point, and I remember looking through the yearbook. This was long before the internet when you could Google things like that, yeah. and just being absolutely taken with the, uh, with the whole construct of the academy about leadership, uh, about mind, body, spirit, 
uh, about the opportunity to serve your country. And I, I basically wrote in my journal, I believe in fifth grade, that I wanted to go to West Point. And I was fortunate enough to go there. Um, those four years there, again, whether it was the academics, the leadership, um, in my six years active duty, um, it was just a, a great training ground. I think that having leadership experiences like that uh, at such a young age, and, and by the way, it starts with learning how to be a follower. <laughs> Very important. Uh, and you can't, I think, have that experience vicariously. It's something you have to go through. Uh, and learning how to, you know, when faced with an issue, how do you rally a team uh, to, to be creative, to come up with solutions? How do you organize them uh, and motivate them to actually do things that they probably wouldn't have considered on their own? Uh, were really important lessons. Um, learning resilience, grit, uh, that sometimes things don't go the way that you want. Uh, you know, another really important lesson I learned uh, in the Army was that it's not enough to admire the problem. And, uh, you know, so often in a business setting, you, you can spend hours, if not weeks, uh, months, or even years admiring a problem. You can wax and wane so intelligently and, you know, describing what it is, but ultimately it's about what are you actually going to do about it. <laughs> and... Uh, and I think that, you know, that, that kind of spirit always existed in the military because of the mission that, you know, ultimately it was about rallying to no matter how high the wall, how thick, how broad, ultimately you were there to, to get through. I, I learned a ton about diversity. Mm -hmm. You know, in my first unit that I went into in the military, I was a minority in my unit. You didn't get to choose who you were working with, what kind of context. So... You came to respect people's humanity around you yeah. at a very fundamental level. Um, you know, I learned the difference between uneducated and unintelligent, where just because somebody perhaps didn't have an opportunity to go to a great school, don't for a second think that they're not very bright. Uh, by the way, I've seen the opposite true. We can have many initials and doesn't necessarily <laughs> equate with uh, the success. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, being in those kind of conditions and having to find a way ultimately to collaborate, to partner, and to work together regardless of your background and where you're from, you really just came to appreciate each other's humanity at a very different level. And I think that's really contributed to, I think, some of the, the empathy that I've tried to have as a leader. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because there are so many commonalities that we have here at Cleveland Clinic. We were founded uh, uh, by four physicians who came back from the First World War, and based on the experiences that they had on the battlefield, they structured the teamwork as a mm -hmm. core idea of Cleveland Clinic. So, so that really, I believe, resonates very, very well with all of us uh, who have a privilege to work, work here at Cleveland Clinic. But when you reflect on those lessons from the West Point and from the military service, what do you think, uh, how effective are we to use some of those learnings and put them more into our today's corporate setting. Uh, what should we be doing differently to get to that same desired effect of teaching people all these valuable lessons that you've just uh, uh, outlined? You know, I, it's interesting. I think there's a few ways that, uh, you know, as I look at my experiences, mm -hmm. but more general, the, the way you look at the mission, let's say, of the military versus the way we can reflect on it in the business world. And I think one is really the importance of having a purpose and a calling. You know, when, you're, when you're a soldier, it's a very high calling. It's duty, it's honor, it's country. Uh, it's actually protecting your nation. Um, and, you know, any, uh, my experience was always, it was, you always had the desire to do your very best for those soldiers around you because you knew that life's depended on you. And, and for me, there, there was no higher calling than that. And, and it really made, it inspired people to do things that, you know, they wouldn't do under ordinary circumstances. And I think what I see today 
in business uh, is particularly with the newer generations of people wanting to be part of something special and to have more of a purpose and not just get into a routine but feel connected to something bigger than themselves. Um, the other part is I think in the military you always felt that you were part of a force for good, ultimately. And I think it's really important for us at this time as businesses in our country to in fact be a force for good. And um, you know, I think in a time when things are so polarized, so divisive, uh, frankly there's vacuums in terms of leadership politically, I, I believe that business done right um, and market forces can be employed in such a way that it actually can create good for many constituencies and stakeholders. And it's certainly something that we've always felt at Johnson & Johnson and we try to do where, look, it, our mission is written by the son of our founder uh, more than 75 years ago was look, a commitment to patients, and he took it even further. He talked about mothers and fa fathers and doctors and surgeons, really personalizing mm -hmm. it. And in the next paragraph, there's a 350-word document. Mm -hmm. This was written in 1943, so today, this is long before corporate social responsibility was even in the vernacular. He talked about a commitment to employees, about how could they be their best? How could they, you ensure that they had dignity and respect? In the third paragraph, he really went off the rails for that time. He said, oh, and you have an onus to give back to the communities where you work and where you live. Even making sure that your suppliers you know, were taken care of, that you took their, your good stewards of the environment. And then, of course, he said, and our shareholders deserve a fair return. And we try to look at that as an and-and, not an either-or. Yeah. And, and I think for business to think in that construct constantly of what are we doing to help these different stakeholders. And, and look, I think it's important to think broadly about yeah. employees and communities, but there's also a certain discipline and rigor that comes with also having your fiduciary responsibility and that gives you the ability to sustain that over the long term. Otherwise, frankly, it can become empty words. Yes, absolutely. So that, that is interesting. Could I just speak a little bit about J&J? &J? Because you clearly a purpose-driven indi individual, and you chose to join the company in which you spent your entire professional career, which is rare in today's corporate environment. What attracted you to Johnson & Johnson, and what kept you in the organizations for, for so long? And just for context for, for our audience, Johnson & Johnson is 136-year-old young yeah. company. <laughs> yeah. You were seventh CEO, yes. if so, which means these are, this is a company with, uh, with a sort of uh, a, a culture of uh, longevity with, within a company. So can you tell us a little bit about what excited you when you, when you joined, joined Johnson & Johnson? Uh, yes, I, I mean, I remember my first interview like it was yesterday. The first question that the uh, manager posed to me was, have you read the Johnson & Johnson credo and what does it mean to you? Okay. And, uh, and here I am, you know, 35 years later, and I asked that same question yeah. on every interview that I conduct. And it, it did appeal to me. I can remember being in the military, having some trepidation about what was it going to be like going work, to work in the civilian world. Would there be that same sense of purpose, that same sense of calling? And I felt having you know, a, a really purpose-driven organization was important. Um, I really was intrigued by healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, my wife was a nurse. I had thought of going to medical school along the way. The idea of doing good, doing well, of, of helping others, um, of all the different kinds of technologies that we had. Even at that point in time, we were involved in pharma, as well as medical devices, uh, as well as consumer. Uh, that intrigued me, uh, because there was always, you know, again, new innovation, new development taking place. Uh, so it was constantly changing. It was a company that also placed a premium on uh, leadership development. 
where it, it took people like me who didn't necessarily have a lot of experience in that particular field, but invested a significant amount of resources, but time and effort and energy in developing people internally. Um, How was that structured, just out of curiosity? Because it's obviously a large company, big scale. How do you, how do you structure leadership development? You know, it, it, it differs based upon what area of the organization you're in. Um, but uh, from very early on, um, you know, you're provided the opportunity to see if you are, in fact, interested in moving into management, to go to leadership development programs, uh, to get exposed to senior management. In my case, I was supported to be, go back to Wharton uh, to get my MBA. You know, another great example I'll never forget, um, following my time of being president of a company in the United States, they came to me and said, you've done a great job, but we want you to get out of your comfort zone and to go to Europe and run our pharmaceutical business in the Europe, M Middle East, Africa, Russia. Got me completely out of my comfort zone. Uh, later on, I was asked to go into our medical device division. And so there were constant challenges that were shown up along the way that uh, you know, were part of my ongoing development, but that, that were, I think, indicative of J&J's broader commitment to you know, really trying to give you a diverse set of experiences learnings and capabilities because you know ultimately that's going to help make the company yeah. better. Which one during this period of challenges you said you were taken out of your comfort zone and I think this kind of tolerable discomfort is very important for professional development which is the biggest challenge that you can think of? Oh I'll never forget uh, definitely going to Europe I mean I was it is not such a bad place. Oh, no, it was nice going to Europe, but let me take you back. It's uh, 2003, so I'm all of 43, and, it, and for many reasons, all our managing directors, so the, the country leaders in Europe, all tended to be like in their 50s. So immediately they're thinking, who's this young, you know, hotshot who we now have to report to? And I remember when I first went over there, you know, they said, well, you're going to go to Germany, and everything is going to be like this. You're going to go to Italy, and everything is going to be like this. <laughs> and you're going to go to the UK, and they will talk and talk and talk, and I get it done. And I went over there, and I found all of that was absolutely the case. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it really made you adapt as a leader. Yeah, then you just go to Croatia. Then you go to Croatia, and you to bring relax, it all, the, yeah. all the, together. And, um, and so you know, I, I had to build a whole new tool chest to be able to connect with, relate to, uh, and hopefully motivate and lead them. You had to learn all different kinds of healthcare systems. You, know, you went from the United States to a national you know, uh, country-based systems. Uh, and by the way, this was 2002. This was just as, in 2003, just as the Iraqi war was kicking yeah. off. Our son was 14 and was going to an international school. I remember him coming home saying, why are they all talking bad about America? Mm. It's not right. And, uh, and so for myself, for our family, you didn't have all the busy stuff to keep you occupied on the weekends. So we really spent quality family time together. And, uh, and so for, for me personally and professionally, lear learning all about the different healthcare systems, how they make decisions, how they operate versus what we did in the United States, I think it helped really give me a line of sight potentially into you know, where ours could go yeah. and transform to. And, and yet, and what, are the, what are the things that we need to watch out for? So it was a really transformative experience for me personally. Yeah. And, and just being out of your comfort zone. It's, it's one thing to go visit Europe, but when you live there, and you, know, you wake up, you, the coffee's different. You know, you, you, yeah. If you're a patient in the healthcare, everything is different. I think that makes you uh, just a more yeah. global person. Yeah, no, that, that is certainly the case. So, then your return became, became the CEO of this gigantic, gigantic company uh, that also moves very rapidly and has so many different, different product lines. Wonderful challenge, wonderful opportunity for, for anybody. Uh, but then let's just kind of far, fast forward in a relatively near past. COVID comes along. What did you think when it all started? Is it gonna hit us badly? What were your anticipation? And then what were the realities as you were kind of one of those companies that were really in the forefront of facing this phenomenal challenge? And we did not have a luxury, as you said, admiring a problem for too long. Right. Uh, we, we, were, we were barely 
capable of describing it, and they, yet we were asked to find the solutions for it. So, can you reflect on that? Well, it um, it was uh, it was quite an experience. Uh, I, I remember vividly in uh, late January of 2020, we uh, we had a senior management meeting down in Florida that could have been a super spreader event in retrospect. And uh, because we you know, had people from around the world and a group of our infectious disease experts um, asked for a meeting with Paul Stoffels, who was head of our research and development. And, and look, I was blessed to, uh, to, be, to have a, as a partner, Paul, who arguably was one of the preeminent um, drug discoverers and developers of the last several decades. And, you know, when I was serving in the military right after I graduated from college, Paul, rather than going into the Belgian military, he did his service by going to the Congo following medical school. And this was the early 80s, just as HIV was breaking out. And he treated many of those patients. And 25 years later, ended up being very instrumental in bringing some of the HIV medications through the entire development process. So certainly someone used to uh, taking on big challenges. He built a great team at J&J. And, um, you know, and it was interesting because we, we weren't a vaccine company. Uh, we had an infectious disease group mainly mm -hmm. focused on HIV. And as frequently as the case in drug discovery and development, about 10 years prior, just as I was coming on board, some of our researchers got together and said, you know, it's not good enough for a pharmaceutical company just to come up with therapeutics to treat a disease, but we should actually be thinking about how do we prevent disease from happening yeah. in the first place. And if you're going to do that in a systematic way, of course, you need a vaccine capability. And we didn't have that internally, so we went out and we acquired a company called Crucell. And we invested about two and a half billion dollars. They had a number of different platforms, and uh, as is often the case, they, many didn't work. And in fact, over the ensuing years, I think we wrote off over a billion dollars. Uh, there were many people in our organization that really thought that there's no way we're ever going to be competitive in the vaccine mm -hmm. space. Uh, it was too competitive. We didn't have enough scale. But what we found is there was there were a few technologies in that portfolio, and one was our ad 26 vector, mm -hmm. which as many of you know is you know, basically a flu virus mm -hmm. that we could reprogram in a way, and that they had worked on with Ebola, and they had done so successfully. So we knew that we had a, a platform that could work in terms of efficacy, it had been used under really challenging conditions in Africa, and the safety profile looked good. And uh, so when they got the genomic sequencing information in January, they basically did not ask for permission. They decided they would beg for forgiveness, and they came forward and said, we think we can do this. Now, we were skeptical at the time because we had been through SARS. Yeah. You know, we had been through Zika. Those things hadn't manifest themselves in a major way, but we said, nonetheless, look, get to work on it. See what you can come up with. And Literally within a matter of weeks then, things changed pretty significantly, such that by early February, through our contacts and our relationships, we you know, worked extensively with the CDC, the WHO. We knew that this was, had the potential to take on a very different track. And actually, the US government came to us because of the work that BARDA had done with us for Ebola. And as many of you in this room know, or who are watching virtually, the mRNA was quite nascent at the time. Yeah, very much so. You know, we had been working on that as an industry for years, and here we had a platform that had already demonstrated efficacy in one area, and the government said, look, we, we, want, we need you to work on this, and that's when we began ramping up. And we, look, we, we did our best from the very beginning. When we charted out the construct, we said, our number one mission is to develop a vaccine that will work for the globe. And hence, we knew that having a single dose wouldn't require you know, a lot of other complicated logistics was going to be yeah. absolutely essential to make that happen. And we also knew that if we, if we did it in a single dose, not only would we get better compliance and access, but we could also 
manufacture twice the number or more of the doses that were going to be required. Which was very critical at the time. Absolutely, uh, because we didn't know we would see these effectiveness rates on the other one. And, and we thought, as you knew, as a Rubik's Cube, every time you adjusted your approach, it could have an impact on efficacy, it could have an impact on safety, it could have an impact on manufacturing capacity. And that's, but that is what's truly remarkable about these new technologies is that you can be doing that at the front end versus some of the guesswork that we would have done with the usual small molecules or proteins that we were working on. And uh, we were very encouraged by the early results that we saw in primate models. We quickly put that into uh, human trials. And look, there were, there were twists and turns along the way, but as I tell everybody, I could not be more proud of our scientists. And look, a lot of these were 35-year-old mothers yeah. who, in addition to working in our labs 24-7, were treating their parents, taking care of their parents, their children at home. We were doing this globally, real time, because we didn't want to have any break in the you know, momentum of the work. So you know, they would be carrying things on uh, over in Europe, in the United States, real time. The, the level of partnership across industry, you know, companies that we would usually be competing with fiercely Saturday mornings, it wasn't uncommon to have meetings with all the heads of research and development from the major pharmaceutical companies and some of the other executives on sharing information real time, what we were learning. And, um, and, and, and look, while we knew that the, the scientific, the, the chemistry, the biology, the engineering was going to be complex, we also knew that getting 330 million shots in arms was going to be a challenge. Yeah. And this was before some of the political issues. And so we, there too, we tried to work very early on with the, both administrations about what could we do to build confidence? What could we do to build the logistics necessary? Uh, because that was going to be a very heavy lift. We worked hard to do this on a global basis. Uh, and you know, there were some countries that unfortunately didn't take it as a innovation-based approach. They took it as a procurement-based approach uh, that became very challenging through you know, some of uh, the rollout. But you know, overall, I think it was a, um, a particularly important time for our industry to, to step up and to make a major difference. And, and look, I, I have incredible respect for the nurses, the physicians here. You know, that we're in the ICU, the CCU, caring for patients day in and day out. And rest assured, that was huge motivation for us to be doing everything we could to help, you know, get in front of that by developing those vaccines. And I think, um, you know, we're, we're fortunate as a country to have had such, you know, an all-out effort to bring us to where we are today. Now, I think when we just reflect on how rapidly that that production of a new vaccine for previously unknown disease, uh, uh, how all of that uh, evolved. It is just absolutely a remarkable story. Uh, but there was something that you mentioned as you spoke with others. So there was an unprecedented collaboration among various lab laboratories uh, from various companies. How difficult was to overcome so that it's traditional uh, closed environment protection of your own IP and uh, open it up and say, we'll collaborate. We're all one. You know, I've got to say it was, it was really not an issue. Um, there were times where there would only be a few days where I wasn't talking to Albert Borla, Stefan Bunsell, mm -hmm. uh, Ken Frazier. I remember calling Ken saying, Ken, I need your capacity. <laughs> Can you free some of that up? And I go, I can't tell you exactly how much how long we're going to need it for, but if we don't have you on board now, there is no way we're ever, and he said, whatever we can do, we're there. Um, and, um, you know, look, I, I would like to think that there's some lessons in there that we can apply potentially in, in, in other areas in a pro-competitive way. Uh, but it, there was definitely a, a sense of, I think, an appreciation for the impact literally we could have on the world at that time and that we needed to do everything we could to bring down some of those barriers. I, I admire and I applaud the FDA. The work that Dr. Woodcock did, in spite of intense criticism from so many corners, 
were it not for the men, the women, the regulators there who were working around the clock to get these approvals through with clearly, and there were times during these clinical trials where we would wake up and read things in the New York Times before we knew about them through our own systems, as I'm sure was the case uh, for you. Yeah, it became the most widely read medical journal in the world. Yes. In the New York Times. That, 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 that and is the, true. And, and the spotlight was intense. Yeah. And uh, the story wasn't always right. Yes, that, that is true. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, and so, you know, I think the fact that we were able to partner and collaborate and share actually helped us get through. Uh, and we certainly tried to do that even when we went out and said, look, we are, we are not going to compromise the clinical development process. And that we wanted to, to be very explicit and public about our commitment when things were being politicized yeah. you know, by so many others. Uh, and again, I think that there's a lot of learnings, uh, but um, I'm, I'm really proud of uh, many of the steps that were taken. I'm, I'm so glad that you have summarized it so eloquently because I think in the heat of the battle, very many people have forgotten about uh, the true amount of effort and accomplishment uh, on a very, very short time frame that impact millions and millions of lives uh, across the world. So thank you and, and, and your colleagues in J&J and many others who have helped us develop vaccines in a, in a record time. That has helped us here who, who cared for so many infected people immensely. So well, well, Tom, and look, I, I have to believe that some of the long-term implications and potential applications for some of these new vaccines, some of these new therapeutics, ther even therapeutics with mRNA and, and other applications, that uh, just as we saw out of you know, the Apollo yeah. uh, you know, missions, where you saw this rapid acceleration of technology, it's my hope that we can apply some of these things in other areas, whether it's cancer, you know, other types of infectious disease, to really make a big difference. So let's just speak about that for a moment, because that's an, another very interesting topic. You're essentially in the business of making big, educated bets yes. on, on the future of healthcare. It's, it's really striking for anybody uh, to think about a two and a half billion dollar investment into a company that is not necessarily the core business, right. and then you have to write off half of it uh, those are some really tough calls. Uh, so which are the big bets that Johnson John, John Johnson is seeing now for the future of healthcare? What are you really, really excited about? Well, you know, the toughest part about stepping out of my role as CEO uh, is my excitement and my belief in this next generation of innovation. I mean, having been in the industry for more than 35 years and you know, seen some really revolutionary things like monoclonal antibodies, minimally invasive surgery, um, and the impact that, you know, so many of these things, or even think about HIV. Um, I remember very early on when I started in the industry in 1987, uh, 1988, I believe if you were diagnosed with HIV at that time, the average life expectancy was about two years. Yes. Today, on the right antiviral treatments, I believe uh, that patients um, will own their their life uh, span is expected to be only shortened by two years. That's a remarkable transformation to go from literally a death sentence to a chronic disease in that period of time. And and so I feel blessed to see we we haven't beaten it yet. And there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. But if I look at the next 10, 20 years. Um, and I see what's happening with some of the cell-based therapies. I mean, and we recently just had some additional results on CAR-T therapies where you know, you're seeing 96% remission rates in multiple myeloma after four lines of therapy. Who could have imagined that a few years ago? And we're still in the very, very early days. There's a lot of more improvement, and we need to do a lot more to improve access to that, to get it to be used earlier, get the durability even better. But you know, with what I'm seeing on some of these new therapies, we, we might begin to you know, use that cure word in some of these treatment areas, uh, gene therapy you know, as well. So tremendous advancement um, in areas like surgery. Uh, I think we're going to see the digitization 
of uh, the operating room at a massive scale yeah. over the next 10 or 20 years. And um, I think, you know, if you consider it now, how many of us would even think about driving a car if it didn't have a GPS system, if it didn't have that little notification, you know, your steering wheel shakes when you are texting. I know nobody in here texts and drives at the same time. <laughs> but let's just say one of your family members and tells you to stay in the lane or that tells you when you need to have another checkup. Think how we basically have done surgery for the last several hundred years. Oh, yeah. And when you look at the potential with robotics of AI and ML uh, to really help us go in and use a much more data-based approach, uh, you know, for example, if it's seen that procedure 10,000 times on YouTube already, how can we then take that information, digitize it, and use it to be a better guide intraoperatively uh, to lead to a better outcome? And... Um, so I think it's really an exciting time. Uh, now, at the same time, we've got to make sure that it's not just about technology, yeah. but ultimately it's about care for, yeah, patients, care for patients, that it's about access for patients, that it's done in a value-based way. Uh, but just if, if I look through my lens out over the next 10 to 20 years, I, I think it's going to be quite transformational. Well, I, I couldn't agree more, but now, uh, before I turn it over to questions from audience, I'm going to widen the lens scope a little bit and ask you a different question. Sure. So we spoke about a future of healthcare, but, uh, you know, Alex he has phenomenal experience in many other industries now. After you stop being a CEO, you've joined boards of several prestigious companies in the United States. You have a very unique background. You've lived and worked around the world. So I'm, and as you said, we, can, we should stop admiring problems in the world and start solving them. So I'll, I'll provide a description of a problem. And then we'll, I'll ask you to, to help us design a solution for it. So the world that we're in right now, uh, so we're in a runaway inflation, most likely getting into the recession. We have... Uh, workforce shortages that are unprecedented in the United States, in healthcare, and across the world. We have, for the first time since 1945, uh, a major war in, the, in Europe that historically always spilled over and always lasted for a very long time. And this time, one of the actors also has access to nuclear power. We have a... Uh, problems with food and food shortage because it's a result of the war. And on top of it, commodity prices are getting, getting out of whack. Description of the problem. <laughs> just just a, a solution. Let me be clear. I am not, <laughs> I am not running for office. Any time. <laughs> so, no. um, you're right. There's a, lot, there's a lot to be pretty pessimistic about. Uh, and you know, one of the things I've always tried to do as a leader is to be what I call a realistic optimist. And that I like to understand the facts, because I think if, unless you can have a steely-eyed understanding of the facts uh, and the data in front of you, that you can go to a lot of wrong places. Uh, but then it's about how do you apply ingenuity, how do you apply technology, creativity, and the human spirit to ultimately make a difference. And, you know, it's interesting, just recently, we were sitting with our son. He's recently married in his, in his early 30s, and a group of his friends were sitting around. And, you know, after a few glasses of wine, I kind of went around the table, and we, you know, had this conversation. And I must say, they, they were much more optimistic than I would have thought. Good. And, you know, a couple of lessons for me, and I think this is especially too, true coming out of COVID, that I think number one is we've got to continue to innovate in everything that we do. Uh, I do believe in the human spirit of innovation, and I, I believe innovation, whether it applies to medicine, whether it applies to our economy, the way we think about EVs, the way we think about digitizing our manufacturing system to bring more manufacturing here to the United States in a value-added way, we have to keep innovating. Um, I think it's important that we remain global. 
You know, one of my big concerns is that through COVID-19, the world's grown increasingly polarized. And I think a big source of lubrication of unification between China and the United States has been business. Yeah. Because in spite of, you know, frankly, both ends of the political spectrum developing anti-China, anti-US sentiments, when businesses are over there interacting, working with people, collaborating, partnering, having to get behind a mission, people tend to overlook some of those other things and they realize that, hey, we're all you know, working together towards a common goal. I think that's, it's important for business to continue you know, to fill that role. I think we need to make sure that we don't leave people behind, that in a um, information, education-based society, that that transition to this new economy that may be much more service-based, there's gonna be cost to that. Correct. And we've gotta make sure that, I, and by the way, over the last 30 years, I think many of those people have been left behind. And what are we gonna do about our education systems? What are we going to do about workforce development and training to make sure that they can be part of it and that they can benefit from that success? And um, those are just some starters, but uh, I'll, I'll, right. remain, I'll, I'll remain the realistic optimist to think that our best days are still ahead. I couldn't, couldn't agree more, and I think this answer underscores why, uh, why Alex Gorski has been so successful uh, throughout his career. So with that, I will turn it over to the audience for questions. We have microphones uh, everywhere, so I think we can start with the first, first question coming from, from there. Vicki Johnson. Hello. Hello. I'm Vicki Johnson and I work here at the clinic and I'm responsible for community outreach and community relations. Thank you for being with us. And I'm wondering, you're a global company and how do you prioritize your many communities? How do you define who your community is and how do you prioritize addressing their needs? It's, it's a great question. I, I think, look, in some ways we consider ourselves part of the global community. And, um, you know, we, we have a presence in just about every country that exists around the world, as long as there's law and order, and, and where there's not, uh, because it, that's a, essential for us to be able to carry on a business, and, and, and where there's not law and order, we do our best to work through appropriate third parties to make sure that our products are available. There is always a certain um, conflict between some of the new technologies and access to those new technologies, particularly when you're thinking about the developed and the developing world. Um, and we do our best to address those. Uh, however, much of that is, can be predicated upon what those local healthcare systems are. And, um, and in those cases, We've got a number of programs where we've worked globally, for example, in, throughout Africa with HIV or things like Ebola to help actually raise the healthcare system's ability uh, and come up with new treatment modalities that can operate in those, particular, those unique environments that can be helpful to them. Um, and you know, in other cases, it starts like right here. Uh, we've got, as I think was mentioned in the introduction, uh, certainly, you know, I think one of the big issue challenges with COVID is it really exposed some fundamental flaws in our system here in our country around healthcare, and that how is it a zip code or two of difference can make such a remarkable difference in the outcomes that we see with patients, yeah. and 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 how is that manifested economically by race by a lot of other issues, and so we're certainly trying to do our part in addressing. Uh, those types of things related to the products that we develop, assisting uh, nurses, physicians in training, clinical trials in other areas. So we do our best. There's more that can be done in that area, but those are some of the things that we think about. So thank you for being you. You remind me of that gentleman sitting next to you. So thank you for being just such an <laughs> awesome human being and leading a great company. Uh, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. I, I believe that Vicky has closed our, uh, our conversation in the most uh, nicest possible and very eloquent way. We thank you very much for finding time to visit us again here in Cleveland. And thank you very much for, for this conversation and we wish you all the best. Well, 
you know, let me just end by thanking all of you for what you do every day, because you being on the front lines, touching patients, helping to set really high benchmarks and standards, uh, not only for the healthcare system here in the U.S., but in the world, um, really inspires us to do our best to support you each and every day. So thank you very much. Oh, you're more than welcome. So just for, for all of you who are here today, thank you very much for attending. And I would just like to announce that uh, we're going to have uh, an exciting lineup of uh, future future speakers here. Ken Frazier is going uh, to be here next. Your, your good friend who you, who you mentioned, executive chairman of the board of Merck, and then Larry Culp uh, uh, from General Electric, people that you know Both all so well. So once again, thank you very much. It was really wonderful to have you. Enjoy. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much.